speaker is Patty Mussolino from Mass General Hospital, and she'll talk about blood-brain barrier in AL. And I also want to introduce Alex Linai, who's somewhere over there next to Dean, <laughs> uh, who has participated in the work that I'm going to be uh, showing you, and is going to also walk us through uh, an amazing tool that he has developed for us, the uh, ALD community. So these are my disclosures, uh, primarily funded by NIH and a lot of foundation support. Uh, I'm part of the Center for ne Rare Neurological Disorders, and I'm going to skip through the pathophysiology and AMN because we have had talks, and this is going to be centered on the dysfunction that happens in ALD in the blood-brain barrier, so that barrier that keeps the inflammatory cells outside the brain, and that could potentially be the cause or, or is part of, the, of the, the pathophysiology of why do we end up with cerebral lesions. So I'm going to be talking about cerebral ALD and the insights that we have learned over the last uh, seven years about what is happening to the blood-brain barrier in ALD. So as you know, the brains of these kids, and it was just being discussed, are, are normal at birth. Uh, they do have the mutation in the peroxisome. They have the accumulation of erodontial fatty acids. And uh, we know there is a period, we call it asymptomatic, where kids and boys are developing normally uh, until we get these very initial lesions in the back of the brain. Uh, and we also know, as Eric also pointed out earlier in the, his talk, that when we see contrast, contrast enhancement is when the disease uh, progression changes dramatically. It accelerates, and over the course of a very short amount of time, sometimes even months, to a couple of years, this destroys a significant amount of the white matter in this picture shown by the white uh, color. Uh, is this the pointer? No, that's also. No, it's, uh, it's moving too. OK, no problem. There is no pointer. That again. So. So I was telling you that after the contrast enhancement, we see this rapid progression. As of now, the window for rescue treatment, and I call them like that, is rescue because we're trying to stop a, a wildfire that is already started inside the brain. And that wildfire marked by the contrast enhancement, and for those that don't think about imaging, contrast enhancement means we're putting a substance, gadolinium contrast in the vein. This has to circulate. And you usually are not able to see it in the brain, as in the picture in the number zero. But if your blood-brain barrier, which is this very specialized thing we have in the vessels in the brain, is not intact, is broken, then you will see the gadolinium as a white rim of contrast around the lesion of demyelination. So if we get to these uh, patients in the early stage, we are able to arrest the disease progression. So. What does it look like inside the brain, that area that has this contrast enhancement? And basically, it looks like this picture that says zone B uh, in the lower quadrant. And it's basically multiple little vessels of the brain full of perivascular, so around the vessels, inflammatory cells. These are called leukocytes. More specifically, they're monocytes. And these are the ones that we think are being corrected when you do a bone marrow transplantation or gene therapy. You are sending into the brain, because the blood-brain barrier is open, these corrected cells that now have the ABCD1 gene functioning and can become less inflammatory and stop the demyelination, the loss of the myelin, which will be some aid in this picture. And we also know that this is the, the, the very, very beginning of the work uh, using this sequence in MRI, which is called perfusion imaging. And just to dismystify it, if you're getting a T1 contrast to see if the lesion has contrast, which is the activity of the lesion, which is the criteria to go into transplant. So all the boys are getting this sequence. When, when they have a lesion in the, in the brain, you can acquire this sequence exactly in the same amount of time that you're giving the contrast and doing your T1 post. It doesn't add time, it doesn't add cost, and it doesn't need to be approved by the insurance. Okay? So just to say it clearly, this is available to everybody that has a 1.5 or 3 Tesla scanner and is given a contrast enhancing uh, a study. It's getting a contrast enhancing study. So what we did find is that this area of contrast enhancement, um, does anybody has a pointer? 
that I could use. <laughs> Uh, this area of contrast enhancement, which is now pointed out with the yellow arrows in the second picture, is what we know is at the leading edge of that loss of myelin. So imagine if this is a wildfire, this will be the line of advancing fire, okay? So that area of contrast enhancement with the, with the yellow arrows is in fact preceded by a low blood flow into that area of the white matter. So that low cerebral blood volume or cerebral blood flow, which is in blue in the next picture, very, very dark, beyond the contrast enhancement, is predicting where the lesion is going to move next. So we found also that few patients that have gotten blood marrow transplantation had correction of that deficit in the blood flow in the brain. So a little bit of how, and I don't know if this is going to work with clicks, so imagining vessels in the brain is something that we don't do all the time. So this is an animation that one of our collaborators did for one of the publications, uh, which shows basically you have red blood cells in red coming from the arteriolar side, and then you have white blood cells. And in a normal capillary bed, so imagine inside the brain, this is one of those little tiny vessels, it's branching out. And normally it flows in a heterogeneous manner. But white blood cells are not supposed to get too much inside the brain. They usually come, get in, sneak, and get out. That's their function. They're like patrolling the brain. But when there is abnormal conditions, like in cerebral ALD, that barrier that separates the blood flowing in the brain parenchyma gets broken, and then you start seeing leakage of these inflammatory cells here as round white blood cells, basically. And the other thing to look at is this blood flow, because the brain is adjusting constantly its blood, blood flow to what it needs. And that is controlled by the heterogeneity, meaning one capillary may be flowing faster because the neuron is firing, and the other one is lower because the neuron is not doing anything next to it. So that's normal blood flow in the brain. When those dynamics are broken, then we have this function of microvascular flow. So. We know that to get into the brain, we talk about contrast enhancement as being one of these key points in the disease where we know the disease is going to accelerate. You need to, if you're an inflammatory cell and you're circulating inside the vessel, which is this round pinkish thing, uh, you need to interact with the border patrol, which is in this case the endothelium. In this picture, the, depicted as a line of darker pinkish cells. Why do you need to interact? Because we're usually flowing, going really fast. And if you really want to get into the brain, you need to stop, roll, adhere, and then you will cross, as you can see in this picture. Um, one pointer. That works? Oh, that's it. OK, OK. Sorry, sorry. And if, OK, that's it? Oh, oh, wow. OK. So you hold it, and then? Uh, OK, don't worry about it. Oh, OK. Oh, I can't, can't hold it all together. So basically, this is a demonstration of the patrol, the endothelium. OK? If you're trying to go in your car from, let's say, Canada to the US, it doesn't matter how important you are. It doesn't matter if you have or not a passport. At some point, if you really want to get into the brain, you're going to have to talk to the person at customs. That patrol person, that, that person at the border is the endothelial cell in the brain. And, and they can decide that you pass, or they can decide that you don't pass. Okay? And then you don't get into the brain, and you can continue to be in the blood flow or get congested, or et cetera, et cetera. So I give you this representation to think about the inflammatory cell as this thing that in normal conditions is not supposed to migrate to the brain and settle inside the brain or destroy the brain. So how does ABCD1 deficiency affect that patrol endothelial cell? We know, as I told you, that a white blood cell will have to do slow down from their flow, interact with the endothelium role, and then cross talk and say, hey, I am coming, here's my passport. And if the endothelium decides it wants to let you in, it will let you come into the brain. So if I zoom into what are those passports that these cells are exchanging one with each other, we have this series of molecules that are basically the adhesion molecules, 
that are making these cells interact with the, the leukocytes, interact with the endothelial cells. And there is these cells, these molecules here, which are called tight junctions, which is a very particular feature that endothelium in the brain has. They're very, very tight as a barrier. Compared to endothelium anywhere else in your body, the brain is the tightest that we have. So what we did was, together with Sandra, which is here in the, in the audience when she was a postdoc at the lab, and she currently is now a child neurologist in Philadelphia, was looking into these molecules in the patient's brain post-mortem from the brain bank, Maryland. And we saw that indeed, these little vessels, this is a normal vessel here, are leaky, meaning they have substances that should not be coming into the brain, leaking into the brain. This is in this case, fibrinogen. We also know that the cells around them are very, very upset and live, like secreting this MMP9, which is a substance that makes the blood-brain barrier very open. It's almost like saying that they got uh, like an order from the um, internal affairs of the country to open the barriers of the, of the, of the, of the, of the customs. Okay? So everybody gets to get in uh, to the U.S. <laughs> Not this day. Um, so <laughs> then if you zoom into that little vessel that I was showing you, there are these little molecules. Remember I, I said tight junction molecules. So one of them and the most important in the brain for that particular tight junction is clouding 5, which is very selective in the white matter. It's very distorted and it's completely abnormal in expression. So we know now that in cerebral ALD, in the pathology, we have leaky vessels that are beyond the leading edge of the myelination, and that these leaky vessels have abnormal tight junctions. So it's easy in a wild forest to see smoke and not know exactly where it's coming from. Okay? So we didn't know when we look at the brain of the histopathology patients, of, of the histopathology of the patients, if this was a problem related to the gene mutation or indirect to all the inflammation and the, and the degeneration that was happening around them. So what we did with Yi Gong was to put these cells on a dish. Uh, these are human brain microvascular endothelial cells. So these cells did live in the brain of a human being. They're coming out in biopsies and they're being uh, sold by companies. And then you put them on a dish and you take down the gene. So you silence ABCD1. And you can see that ABCD1 can be silenced very successfully. So ABCD1 is almost not expressed at all. And one thing that we saw was that ABCD2, ABCD3, and ABCD4, which can come to rescue the ABCD1 function, are not doing it. Meaning these cells cannot compensate when they lose the ABCD1 gene. So we saw that this loss of the ABCD1 gene had serious consequences on the endothelium. And one of them, as I was telling you, this uh, clouding 5 molecule, uh, severely downregulated. This is the tight junction molecule that keeps the cells from not letting anything pass. And also, these other ones, the passport molecules that I was talking about, ICAM, PCAM, VCAM, which are in the interaction between endothelium and leukocytes, are being upregulated. So, in few words, these endothelial cells, when they lose ABCD1, they're getting leaky and sticky, okay? So they're interacting too much with the leukocytes and they are being leaky. We show that this is really happening in a dish and this is, a, it's an, this is the endothelium here in a monolayer and then you sit, make them uh, interact with monocytes, with these inflammatory cells. Each dot here in white is one of those inflammatory cells. And you can see that after the ABCD1 is silenced, there is an increased number of cells compared to the control. And we also saw that this was happening in the brain, but not in endothelium from other parts of the body, which is, in a way, not surprising, because in the only part in the body that we know inflammation is occurring in ALD is in the brain, in the white matter. And it seems to be very selective to their barrier function. These cells can get through, and one of the most surprising things to us was that the changes that we were seeing in function of the endothelium is that all of that I show you was happening at 48 hours when the very large emphariasis here in black are not yet elevated. The cells will go and end up having elevation of very large emphariasis at 72 hours, but the changes that we're seeing in function and proteins in these cells are preceding the elevation of very large emphariasis. 
And in fact, if we add very long chain fatty acids to the medium, like here, we don't see a dramatic change in these molecules like Claudin-5. There is a trend, but it's not as significant as when you lose the function of ABCD1. So we dig a little bit more into what is the mechanism, what is the pathway that ABCD1 uses to disrupt the function of the endothelium, why do we care about the mechanism? Those are the drug targets. If we can understand how ABCD1 makes the endothelium sticky and leaky, and we can intercede in between, that could potentially restore the function of ABCD1 in the endothelium, and the dream being we can prevent cerebral ALD. So we found that TGF beta is significantly involved, that if you block TGF beta pathway, you can rescue Claudin-5, and these cells are less sticky and less leaky. And then we know that the mouse doesn't get the cerebral disease. And I don't know if you knew this, there is a mouse model, but it gets AMN, it doesn't get cerebral disease, it doesn't matter what you do to it. And we found that the mouse cells, interestingly enough, are very different from the human cells. When they lose ABCD1, they don't behave like the human cells. They're not sticky and they're not leaky. So here is where we said, okay, we cannot be working each of these molecules that I talked to you about. It takes around six to 12 months to do the experiments, to set up everything. It's very, very long time. So we decided instead of doing one at a time to do something a little more um, screening based and we did a transcriptome analysis. So we look at all the genes that were altered when ABCD1 was silenced in these human cells and in these mouse cells. And I wanna stop here because we spent two years looking at this data in front of the computer, up and down, with different people, with different investigators, with computational biologists. It was very difficult to make sense of it. With all the databases already available online, and it was not until Alex uh, came to Florian, and Florian put it in contact with me, that we were able to visualize the, what the, the genes that are being altered after the silencing of ABCD1 are doing. So I want to pass the, the talk now to him. He's going to unplug and plug another computer, and he's going to show us and walk you through something that he's making available for any researcher, any investigator, or anybody that wants to take a look or share data to compare the gene expression of the different cell types that we have been investigating across the years in, in ALD. So Alex, I'll, he's behind Great. that because he's gonna use yeah. his, his computer. So um, <laughs> we have the audacity of doing some uh, AV uh, acrobatics here. So I'm gonna give a live demo. We're gonna, hopefully it will work. Hopefully the demo gods are with me. Um, so yeah, so to, to sort of recap, we're interested in the blood-brain barrier. We're interested in sort of permeability, selective permeability of the brain, blood-brain barrier and how that might be dysregulated in the context of ALD. And so Patty has done this, this you know, uh, Patty and people she's worked with have done this work to sort of trace how sort of cloud in 5 and other molecules, the, the, the permeability, the sort of, you know, integrity of the barrier, of the blood-brain barrier is, is diminished in the context of losing ALD. And so I was brought on or I was asked to join to sort of investigate how that might be arising. What other sort of things we can track to try to understand why sort of the blood-brain barrier ceases becoming a barrier in the context of ALD. So um, I'm gonna just kind of walk through some visualizations that I built to try to sort of get at um, uh, uh, what's, what's happening um, in this particular system. So the first visualization I built um, is called a volcano plot. Um, and a volcano plot is a way of sort of looking at, in the context of this particular experience, experiment, which is RNA-seq, you look at sort of um, all the genes in the genome and how they behave in a particular experimental condition. So here, the red dots on the left and right represent genes that are upregulated and downregulated when you lose ABCD1. So if you lose ABCD1, a bunch of genes, a ton of genes will actually go up, will be increased. Whereas a ton of other genes, the ones on the left in red, will go down. The ones in the yellow in the, yellow in the middle aren't changing very much. Um, you can read the y-axis as how confident we are that they're changing, and the x-axis as how much they are up and down. And so this allows us to go and look at all the genes in the genome, of which there are something like 20,000, and ask, you know, how does this genome, how does this gene change when you lose ABCD1? How about that one? And you can begin to, begin to sort of like look into um, what cells, how cells are behaving, right? You can think of each, these cells, when they lose ABCD1, they freak out. What do they do? What, what sort of like defense do they mount? Um, and so this is a way that we can sort of look for alternate other genes that are involved uh, in ABCD1, and that can, that can help us sort of understand what might be targets for, for, for therapies. Um, if, can we intervene in other parts of the pathways that ABCD1 is involved in? 
So this was you know, a good start. Patty was enthusiastic about this, so we kept going. So the next plot that we generated is um, a pathway, let me quickly, a pathway bar plot. So um, in biology, there are a bunch of pathways. There are a bunch of genes that act in concert to you know, create particular cellular functions. And we might be interested in sort of investigating subsets of genes, because as you saw, there are a lot of dots, there are a lot of genes. We might be interested in looking at subsets of those. So for example, I can look up um, all the genes that the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes lists as involved in the peroxisome. So there are a bunch of genes um, that interact in the peroxisome. You can see that when you lose ABCD1, ABCD1 is the most down. So here, the x-axis is how much you have, and the color red or blue is whether it's up or down in ABCD1, in ABCD1 loss or ALD. So each of these genes um, you know, goes up or goes down when you lose only ABCD1. Obviously, when you lose ABCD1, ABCD1 is down. That's not surprising, that's the bottom gene here. But all these other genes also sort of react. And we can begin to ask, like, what goes up when you lose ABCD1? And then what else goes down? Um, and you can look at any particular biological function. Um, it's not displaying quite right on that screen. It's, it looks great on my screen. Um, the best part of this is that it is all at a URL, which you know, we'll send around. So you can go actually begin to investigate hypotheses of your own. You, know, you might have particular parts of you know, cellular metabolism that you want to investigate. You can go and look them up here. Um, also importantly, uh, you can filter by sort of like fold change and uh, p-value, so how confident you are. So for example, to make this picture more manageable, I can say only those genes which are like pretty substantially different, right? And then we have a sort of like narrower picture, right? ABCD1 and these genes are all pretty seriously down, but there is one gene that's pretty seriously up. We might want to go investigate how, what that gene is and what it does. Um, okay, so we kept going. So our lab is really interested in network biology. By our lab, I mean the Frankel lab at MIT. And so we took all these genes, and we, we know that each of these genes interacts with other genes. And so we can actually sort of put together a network um, of all these genes and sort of begin to, to think about sort of if this gene is up, what does it mean for this gene, for there to be more of this gene when you lose ABCD1 and less of this other gene? And caviolin 1, which is CAV1, which you guys can't see super well here, is one of those genes that sort of we can think about the biology of. It has to do with blood-brain barrier permeability. So you lose ABCD1, you know, um, the blood-brain barrier is more permeable, but we can say since CAV1 is down, you know, there, there are particular ways in which it's permeable and not others. Um, so this is one of the ways that you can sort of like go in about visualizing um, how the biology is changing. And you can even um, make a picture using this tool. Let's see if this works, which actually has like a little diagram of a cell. So each of these boxes, now that these genes are in, are actually little cellular organelles. So cells are these little machines, they have little parts, and the parts are all sort of like inside these little bubbles inside the cell, if you like. Um, so this is a diagram where each of these genes is now located, these, each of these circles is located where that protein localizes in the cell. Um, and so you can look at each of these vesicles and say, okay, so this gene is up, it's a gene that is in the plasma membrane, it interacts with this gene in the nucleus, right, which is down, so like, what can we, how might we be able to think about sort of pathways, you know, really understand the biology that's happening inside this particular system? Okay, didn't stop there. So, so next, um, next I generated these plots called braid plots. Um, and so this in particular is a braid plot that it looks like I already had up. So this is the uh, endothelin pathway. I don't know what pathway that is. Let's go pick another one. Let's pick our, the peroxisome, our, fr our favorite. So this is the peroxisome um, in orange are, let's see, in orange is the healthy, and blue is the ABCD1 knockout. So blue here is what, what we expect to represent um, ALD. Um, so these are all the genes involved in the peroxisome, um, and these, these are sort of the levels that we find in the particular system that we're looking at. And so each of these, I really like this plot. This is actually the favorite of the ones that I've generated. It's a little unique in biology. People usually don't make these plots in biology, but you can sort of trace how these cells are behaving along each of these particular axes, where each of these axes is a gene, right? And you see these concerted differences. So if I scroll down here, you see this big, huge ABCD1, right? All right, sure, if you, if you have this disease, you have no ABCD1. If you don't have this disease, you have, you have plenty. But all these other genes are also sort of changing in a pretty concerted way. And so we can go about thinking, you know, wh what, is, what is happening here? What are, what are all these changes? What do they represent? And so I'm gonna show one last. So this kind of figure is more typical. Um, in biology, it's called a heat map. Um, and so here on the y-axis, these are all genes. Um, the colors represent how much there is. Um, and on the x-axis here, um, on the left, I think we have the controls. And on the right, we have the ABCD1 knockouts, which represent effectively the disease. Um, and we can go about sort of choosing any particular 
gene set, as usual, um, and investigate it. So here we have the proxisome, but we might be interested in sort of, I think Patty told me that she was interested in leukocyte migration, so let's quickly see if we can ask about leukocyte migration. Uh, leukocyte migration. All right, big pathway, okay. Yeah, and so we can go about checking out, you know, how do these particular, let me try to make the figure manageable here. How do these particular genes change? You know, we might be interested in any particular subset of the genes, um, any particular, it's washing out, oh, okay. All right, well in any case, um, and importantly, this is all available on the web. Um, and so I'll show you one last thing, which is something that I've been working on in the past um, month. So we took this and we took it one step further, um, which is that we gathered all the data sets that have been sort of like generated and publicly available about ALD that are just, you know, out there, that all the experiments that have been done on ALD. So we, um, there's a particular experiment that was done at the Whitehead, uh, which involves microglia, that's this one. Um, our data sets, we have human endothelium, mouse endothelium. There was a group at Minnesota that did IPSC endothelium. Um, and these guys, I think, are fibroblasts. Uh, that, that's, that's a, yeah, it's a group from Korea that did fibroblasts. So in any case, we, gener we were able to put these all together, and now we can ask about the biology relating to a particular vesicle, let's say the proxisome, or any other sort of pathway that's been mapped out, um, and ask sort of how are all, each of these individual cells reacting to losing ABCD1 or not. Um, and this, I think, allows us to sort of bring together all the data that's been sort of like generated about ALD, um, or in particular people studying cells that have, you know, ABCD1 uh, dysregulated, and begin to think about this, you know, this, I think this provides a tool for, for real biologists, not systems biologists like myself, to really think about um, how these systems play together and begin to, to envision, you know, better, more specific targets uh, to help to restore function uh, in ALD loss or ABCD1 loss. Take it from, from here and show you. So first of all, Alex, how long would it take you for any data set to be uploaded and put into this so you can interact and play and take it out and look at your gene or when you're reading a paper and you came across this pathway, you want to see what it looks like in the brain endothelium, in the microglia, in the iPS cells? 30 minutes. And he's giving his time already. He has generated all these tools. So uh, this is truly an invitation for anybody that is mining data on ALD in your lab or wants to access data that you don't even have because this is publicly available. So going back to the story of the policeman <laughs> and the endothelium that is letting your inflammatory cells come to the, to the brain or not, we look using these visualization tools, we look at different pathways that we know in biology are relevant to make this interaction possible. And in very brief, uh, summary, we're going to show you what we found. The endothelial cells that are ALD, ABCD1 deficient, have a failure in angiogenesis. They cannot regenerate themselves very well. They have shut down their cell cycle. They are also upregulating, downregulating this thing called neuroregulating one, which is the master regulator of the tight junction infrastructure for endothelial cells in the brain through the RASC, ERK, AKT pathways. Uh, they also have an increase in the permeability to not just inflammatory cells, they have increased in permeability to small molecules. And just to remind you that the gadolinium that we see in the boys, in the brain MRIs, is a small molecule. And in that molecular weight, which is around 150 kilodaltons, ABCD1 deficient endothelium will also have an increase in permeability to this molecular si size. And, and I told you that they have an increased interaction with these monocytes. So we have found some of the pathways that are involved in this interaction as being abnormal. And here I represented like the endothelial in green and then these white blood cells are the white spots that you're seeing now crossing as they flow. So usually in the control, you, it looks like it's going faster. It's not going faster, it's the same speed of flow. We are making the blood flow and you're looking with the camera inside the vessel basically. And what you're seeing in the wall is the endothelium, and those that, that are stuck, or you can see rolling, you see how they're going very slow, are the cells that are getting increased interactions. And it's very dramatic, the difference between an ABCD1 deficient cell. And you can see how many more are rolling, getting stuck, and if you st like stare enough, you're going to see them disappear. When they disappear, is that they cross the wall. They went into the U.S. They passed the customs. Okay, so <laughs> this is um, 
Um, this is what we found in terms of the uh, uh, essays. And why are these essays important? Because then we can put different drug drugs and FDA approved drugs that are already available and see if anything can modify this interaction and decrease this uh, interaction. We can get really complex on how to make these pathways like make sense. So kind of tell the story, the full story. This takes years and a lot of time of very, very dedicated people to come up with, uh, and I invite anybody that is interested and has a lot of uh, time and wants to put it in this, we will make everything available so you can also mine and get your own results and conclusions, and we need experts in metabolism, like Dr. Ann Moser, who has helped us with all the very long chain fatty acid um, uh, studies. Uh, so in brief, we know that when ABCD1 is not in the paroxysm, in these endothelial cells, the tight junctions are open, the interaction with the white blood cells are increased, and that leads to an increased permeability to inflammatory cells. So the question is, can we see this in patients? Are we seeing this, other than the contrast enhancement in gadolinium that we talked about at the very beginning? Are we able to see, because if I, what I show you is calls true, everybody that has ABCD1 deficiency, that means AMN patients, asymptomatic boys, asymptomatic adults, and a ALD boys, will have some trouble with a macrovascular flow. You remember that picture that I showed you at the beginning with the blood flow in the capillary. So using dynamic susceptibility contrast perfusion imaging, and this is how that works in, in reality, that's an MRI of the scan in the, in the brain, and you can see the contrast coming in and out of the brain. And the brain usually has two ways of increasing its blood flow, so if there is more demand, it needs more blood, so it will just open the faucet, basically increase the blood flow, or it will take that and homogenize the, the flow and do this thing that we are seeing here, making every capillary flow as fast as they can to extract the maximum amount of oxygen. It comes from a convoluted mathematics that our collaborators in Denmark have put together. Uh, in an algorithm that we can use to post-process that would allow us to see these two variables, the CTH, the capillary transient time heterogeneity, so basically the heterogeneity between the flow, spe the speed flow in one capillary versus the other versus the other, and the K-up, which is a constant of permeability. This is like the contrast enhancement, but much more sensitive than the contrast enhancement. So we said, can we see this changes in interaction in the brain microvasculature in the patients. And to our surprise, in a very small number of patients, we were able to find significant differences. And you can see in the first row is CTH of a control versus a hemicygote. These are patients without cerebral disease, just deficiency of ABCD1. And we can see that their white matter is in trouble in the sense of it's trying to compensate for a microvascular flow dysfunction. And it does it pretty well, because we know how well these people can function. But there is this function that we can register and see with the MRI. We know that this has some difficulties in, in the metabolism of oxygen. And importantly, when we look at the areas of the brain, and here you have in the color gradient the frequency of the lesions in the brain. So if you take all the patients that we have in our clinic, these are 47 cerebral ALD patients, and we look at how frequent are these lesions in the back of the brain, in the front of the brain, the probability of getting cerebral ALD corresponds with that heterogeneity of the flow that I was telling you. Not only that, it also corresponds with the time in life which cerebral ALD is most common. So the heterogeneity of flow in pinkish bottoms is basically five and 10 years of age, which is the most common time to develop cerebral disease. And, and it's not the same in control. At the beginning, do you want me to change? And we're getting to the end too. Um, uh, one of the slides that Florian showed at the very beginning of, of the meeting, which is basically what we think we can do with these sequences, and also to answer one of the questions earlier on of do we have a better biomarker or mechanism. So we can see the T2 lesion, which are, you see that in this case there is nothing. This is a baseline scan in a, in a boy that is being screened with MRIs every six months. And then you see the CTH and the K2, which is the permeability variant. And this is 13 months later, we fast track, we just skip one MRI, just to show you that there is a still no T2 lesion, and there is no contrast enhancement, but 
see the CTH with that which is preceding the T2 lesion by around six months. In fact, the K2, which is the permeable constant, is almost a year before we can even see the T2 lesion. And this is only price with contrast. We cannot get this sequence if you don't do a contrast enhancing MRI. So this is something that we will have to continue studying and understanding to determine if there is value on having contrast enhancement MRI screenings on these ALD boys that are going to be diagnosed by newborn screening. We also know that this parameter that I'm talking about, the CTH, responds to treatment. So if you have bone marrow transplant, your CTH is higher before you get the transplant, and it normalizes after one year, and it's sustained normalized to even two years after transplant. We got very little data on the patients that have this rare self-arresting disease, so they start with a lesion and they stop by themselves. They also have different CTH values. They have more normal CTH values. So CTH seems to be a good predictor of who is at risk of progressing in the disease. So I love, and this is basically a summary of what we have said uh, this far. On the white, you have the lesion, and you can see it's going to loop again. And you can see the lesion starts before treatment, and that's in red is the perfusion deficit. This is how much the microvascular is. And the result of hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, where it com almost normalizes this microvascular dysfunction. So with that, we know that ABCD1 is altering the custom patrol person in the brain, and that may be predisposing to an abnormal interaction with this inflammatory that will end up allowing them into the brain when they shouldn't. Um, the, we know that this microvascular dysfunction is highest in the times of development where the kids are at higher risk. And we also know that the transplant can correct the microvascular dysfunction. So in summary, we have now in vivo tools where we can try testing mechanisms that may reveal novel therapeutic targets and in vivo tools to use them as biomarkers. So we currently are working uh, to develop a risk prediction using this and also to identify these novel biomarkers. And again, I want to put a little bit of an accent on if we want the complexity of models that we are all using, uh, we're going to need some tools that can allow us to mine data that is not very familiar to us. And I think that the tool that Alex has developed is allowing us to start doing at least some of those like co-registration uh, of, of information to, to kind of like pollinize the, what, the work that everybody is doing in their sites. And this takes a ton of people. <laughs> and I kind of be more thankful to Florian Eichler, who has been my main mentor on the ALD side. Bruce Rosen is the imaging mentor. Enco is the guy that is the, the father of the neurovascular unit. And Dr. Grabowski, who has taught me a lot about this flow adhesion essay, how they interact. Um, we have collaborators all over. And it uh, has been thrilling to be working with this community. Just to give you an idea, I was just a resident. I went to my first ULF meeting. I met the mom that you all know that started campaigning with a band the entire country to get different screening. And, and it was a one time deal. From there on, I hooked with ALD, and for the last 10 years, I've been working on ALD. <laughs> Although I'm a vascular neurologist and I do stroke. <laughs> but don't tell that to my patients. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Any questions? Can I, can I take it? Fascinating. Um, excellent presentation. And uh, the stuff that you were showing, very cool. <laughs> I don't use word cool. <laughs> uh, my question, uh, questions actually, um, remember you shown that slide with the flow of leukocytes in the blood vessels in real life? Uh, what are those cells that are, or which, part, which leukocytes are those cells that are actually 
sitting down and sludging and not moving, do we know? Monocytes. They're all monocytes. <laughs> Perfect. There, there is, there is 5% yeah. lymphocytes. Yeah. They come, they roll, and they, they leave. They don't, they don't transmigrate. Perfect. Okay. And second is, uh, what's your hypothesis in now knowing about the occludin and the claudin and after transplantation, what is the molecular steps that are happening potentially uh, that could be bringing about this improvement? Such a, such a great question. So I've been searching the Maryland Brain Bank every year for the possibility of answering the question with a little bit more robust data by looking at a transplanted brain that had engraftment and see what cells are where. Uh, and it hasn't been yet possible. Uh, but I do know that I show you those pathways, the AKT, the MYC, the TGF beta pathways. It's very interesting. The endothelium, at the end of the day, is the guy sitting in customs. He's following orders, okay? So it is the microglia and the perivascular monocyte who is telling the endothelium how to interact with other ones of their same family. It is also the oligodendrocyte and the neuron which is telling the endothelium, let in, not let in, or give me more flow, don't give me so much flow. So. The, bomb, the transplant could be working by correction of these perivascular cells, which we know is where the transplant cells end up leaving after you transplant. They don't go on far away from the vessels. They stay really close to the vessels. And they might be now regulating and contra-resting for those mutant cells uh, the function of, of the gene that is now less inflammatory. That's one. And number two, the only one that I have access to see that there was a chimeric uh, donor uh, where you can see the endothelium is also being corrected. And that's not surprising. We know, we know the, 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 the green pictures that I show with endothelium are my own endothelial cells from the blood. Okay, so if we take blood from anybody, you have endothelial precursor cells floating around, ready to go and repair any vessel that you like damage because you bruise your knee or anything. So bone marrow transplant, CD34, umbilical cord, or whole bone marrow are providing endothelial precursor cells. And we know on the other one that we have antibodies done for ABCD1, that a patient that has been transplanted is a German uh, reported patient, that endothelium is being corrected. So are we maybe replacing the endothelium and sealing back the blood-brain barrier? I think it's a combination of probably both. You are changing the neighborhood, and you're also changing the patrol guy. So now you have new policies, and you have the right nice guy that asks you the passport with a good will <laughs> of helping you. All right. I guess it's time for a break then. Thank you.